This is our infrastructure session and sustainable future. Uh, again, presented by WGIC, the World Geospatial Industry Council. And uh, in this session, we're gonna look at how geospatial earth observation technologies can be used in service of sustainable future uh, around the globe. So we have a lot of subject matter experts, thought leaders on this topic here joining us today. I'll let them introduce themselves in, in more depth here in just a second. But we've got a number of our member companies represented uh, here on the on the stage with us today. So we have uh, to my left here Peter uh, Rummel from Bentley. He's going to be talking to us about curating data sets, imagery, and the role of, of eye twins and digital twins. We have Dijon here with us from DataDev, and he's going to be talking to us about data and sensors again as they relate to some of the emerging technologies such as digital twins. Uh, we have Andrew Carey with us. He'll be talking to us about future of infrastructure uh, from the perspective of GIS tools and platforms with us from Esri, I should say. We have Chris Trevelyan, who's, who's joining us from Trimble, uh, commenting on the role of integrating cloud infrastructure into collaborative data. And last but not least, we have Larry Fox with us today talking about field data collection. So with that, gentlemen, I'm going to ask you to each provide just a, an opening statement introducing your company and your expertise on this topic. And uh, if we can keep those to five or six minutes, then we'll move into our discussion session. So we'll start with you, Peter. Yes. Um, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, it's a pleasure to be here, and I thank you. I know it's the third day of the trade show to be still with us. So as Andrew already mentioned, I'm from Bentley Systems. And the topic of this session resonates really with us because our company purpose is advancing infrastructure for a better quality of life. So the title was exactly for us and our how do we do it? It's we empower people to build, plan, operate more resilient and better infrastructure. So this technically reaches out into the future quite nicely. And how do we do it? It's done by digital twins. And unfortunately, after these three days, the good news is everybody talks about digital twins, but um, probably everybody has a different thing in mind. So I'd like to go one step back and say it's, it's all about data. If we have data, there are not per se digital data. We need to have a transformation, and it's not only digitizing it, we need to keep in mind there are structures involved and processes and politics and mindset. So if we start from the digital transformation, we need to keep this in mind. And from my understanding, the digital twin is an intelligent way to handle the complexity and the amount of data. And it's an end goal we are more or less approaching to, but it's just a question to which degree we are going there. And it's important for us to have this kind of um, tool with us because we need to be prepared to look into the future. And the interesting thing is, if we talk about the future of the infrastructure, we need to plan it today because most of our infrastructure has a life cycle which is 20, 50, 100 years. So Basically, if we do not plan exactly how the infrastructure in 2030 or 2050 should look like, we failed. So digital twin is a key element on this and we need to plan for the future. And I think during the last call, it was mentioned one important thing. We need to consider diversity. If we look into nature, diversity is the foundation for evolution to get something better. If we look at teams and the new management thing, diversity enables us to be creative and innovative. So we need to have tools that are diverse. And to embrace diversity, we need to be open. And I'm coming to the end of my statement, and this is important. We are looking into openness, and if we talk about it, we talk about open AI, open standards, or open source. One thing I'd like to encourage all of us moving forward is not forget about the mindset. I think we had the discussion I listened to before. We do not have a lack of data. We do not have a lack of skills. 
we might have a lack of the right mindset to really do it. Take data into information, do the decisions, and act based on it. And that's exactly what we need to ensure for the future of our infrastructure. Thank you, Peter. Dion? Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. It is the third day already. Everybody pretty bit tired. But I hope we will have a good discussion here. So I'm coming from uh, DataDev. It's an international company based in uh, Serbia and Germany. And uh, we deal exactly with, uh, with, uh, with this kind of data. Uh, we are supplying customers uh, all around Europe. And uh, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't say world, but it's uh, Europe. And we have, a, as I like to say, it's a user experience. In the end, we know uh, what is exactly needed, and we try to supply uh, this product. So today, we will speak about the future of infrastructure. And the uh, interesting thing is uh, what I heard as well. It's not like uh, that we have a lack of data. Everything is there. It's more like how bring it to the customer, to the end user, how make it like uh, a sexy product that they can use without too, too much efforts, because in the beginning everybody likes to uh, play with it, to try to do it on their own. It's a huge amount of data, and uh, uh, it become with the new sensors all over the market, uh, uh, more and more heavy, if we speak about terabytes and gigabytes. And uh, we are here basically to see how to bring this uh, to the end user uh, in, a, in a nice manner that they can use it really properly without too, too, too much efforts. Thank you. We'll move on to Larry. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Larry Fox. I am the VP of Marketing and Business Development with a company called Bad Elf. We are a GNSS hardware manufacturer with a services component that actually teaches basic field data collection and how users, customers can develop a system of record. I think my take from this is quality data collection. We're finding in the industry, some of our largest customers are small municipalities, towns, uh, electric co-ops, water utilities. A lot of their assets are still based on paper. We find that just them learning how to do the basics of data collection to create that system of record is, is, a, is a key element to, be, to them being able to better manage those assets, to be able to develop the insights into what to do with those assets. So I think as a panel, we're going to discuss various looks at how various entities ingest this data to start with. Our focus being a GPS provider is collecting that data with very high quality, teaching the rigors that you would from the survey industry, for example, and applying that to the geospatial industry. There is so much insight to be gained by collecting water meters, various other assets, and protecting that data from the future. For example, there are many entities, as I mentioned, that are still using paper maps. We've worked with uh, entities that have lost those paper data or had the folks who retain the tribal knowledge of where everything is. Digitizing this and creating the digital twin is something that's really near and dear because now it extends beyond you know, any particular person. It's now an organization that has access to information that can be managed for the next 20, 30 years and beyond. So thank you. Thanks, Larry. To Larry's left, we have Andrew. Uh, hello, everybody. Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us on the third and final day of Energeo. My name is Andrew Carey. I'm coming this afternoon to talk to you guys about Esri, a uh, worldwide leader in GIS software. Uh, we provide software tools to help our customers with all location-based data. Uh, helping customers manage that data, visualize that data, make better decisions with that data. So when, as a, at the core, it comes down to Esri is a database software company. Uh, all, lo all data that has location information can be visualized, compared to one another, uh, to help us make those better decisions, create a more sustainable world. Um, 
I work on the remote sensing and uh, the imagery and remote sensing team. So for me, uh, having conversations around the future of 3D GIS, understanding how we visualize, how we compare, build data sets that help us uh, understand the new and evolving, changing world that we all see for ourselves. Um, that's what I'm here to talk about today. Thank you. Thanks, Andrew. Uh, yes. Hi, everybody. Thanks for sticking around. Um, I am not Boris Skopiak, so if you're hoping for a Croatian accent uh, today, sorry to disappoint you. I'll bring you a North American accent, but I'm with Trimble Navigation. Uh, and, uh, you know, our mission is to transform the way the world works. And specifically with the geospatial team that I'm involved with, uh, we're really focused on converting the physical elements into digital assets, right, for the for the right stakeholders, right? Whether that's a designer, whether that's somebody in operations or maintenance of a uh, transportation asset uh, or our assets in other communities. So what we're most focused on is really kind of streamlining that process from conflict identification to resolution. So if I think about identifying something in the field, in the physical world that's wrong, how does that feed into the design process, back into the design process to update uh, and resolve the conflict. So moving from a point of contention to a point of resolution in the fastest manner possible. And I think that's so important because not only um, not only is the infrastructure planning, but just the sheer volume of infrastructure we have today that needs to be updated, that is at the end of its life cycle, as Peter talked about, that's a daunting task. And most of these companies are working on such thin margins that we need to do everything we can to help improve that process flow not just for ourselves, not just for uh, the users of our technology, but also the consumers in the community that are utilizing the water or the, or the infrastructure to drive on or the energy to power the next generation of AI. So. Thanks, Chris. So we know who you are and we know what you do today, but this is a future-looking panel. And so my first question to the, each panelist would be to take us on a little bit deeper dive. How does what you're doing today service the future in, in a sustainable way? And how do you see it changing over the next, say, five years? Peter. Um, I think it's important to go back to this idea of um, a digital twin. And if I see a system, I have three categories. Number one, I look at the system and I have no clue what's happening. Level two is I see the system and I can watch and understand what's happening. And the place where we'd like to be with our infrastructure is, we know the system, we know what's happening, and we bring us in a position that we can influence it in a way that we can mitigate changes or threats and um, to balance the resources. So one good example might be uh, mobility. So if I have mobility, I have my digital twin of my streets, we talk about all the sensor stuff. And if I see I have traffic jams, I might be in a position, and this is just an example, to say, okay, I have rush hour, and this is a problem, because peak load for a system is always an issue. So let's take it, um, use pricing as an incentive, and say, okay, you have to pay from eight in the morning to 10, some amount per kilometer, the rest of the time you don't have it. So you use some technology or to really drive behavior to manage the resource road and improve the value of mobility. This was an example we need to be more digital and have real-time information to interact in real time and to monitor it. And this is an example, it works with electricity. To finalize on this one, Interesting idea, we pay the same price for our electric power all the time. We might have situations where we have more electrical power, so it might be for free or you even get paid for the service to take this electricity. And in other times where we have not enough sun or wind power or whatever, you pay a higher price. So the key message is we need to have the data and the possibility to interact in both directions to manage our resources better and then it helps us to mitigate all the challenges. Thank you, Peter. Dion? Yeah, so uh, where we can see it in five to 10 years, yeah, so basically our company is uh, specialized in uh, mobile mapping services, and we, um, we work with uh, 
uh, different sensors, so most of them are from Trimble. And uh, uh, basically what we can see from the, from the customer perspectives is their needs. And uh, more and more we have uh, requests for um, um, high imagery, really, really, really high imagery. And this is also, when we speak about the data, huge amount of data, how to, how to use it, how to process it. So basically, according to me, what will happen in five to 10 years, we all already have an overload with, the, with this data, let's say all these sensors are bringing so much data to us. So we need to process it, we need to put it on some kind of online platforms, but this, um, this will happen actually. And uh, this give ability to, to the final user uh, to, to use it in the proper way, uh, to use it, to make it easy. Uh, and then uh, you spoke about the papers and this is reality. We still have uh, uh, many companies or many uh, uh, expertise that are using some kind of analytics uh, or, or paperwork. And um, everything will become digital. It's already digital. And everybody will use digital twin. And yes, there is different uh, definitions and uh, seeing of that. But one example is, for example, HD maps. We work with... Um, 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 automotive industry with the cars uh, where we produce um, high definition maps for navigation and the initial sensor is from mobile mapping data so point cloud and imagery and um, up to now most of the companies they use it so uh, they produce it on your own on their own and uh, uh, now they are facing uh, a challenge it's how to renew these maps so it's basically when you uh, collect the data when you transform it in the proper map use it inside the car and then it's a question how to renew these maps after one day two days some construction site happens and uh, these kind of things and then actually in between magic should happen so these data should be processed in that way that we have a result in the real time and uh, okay thank you very much uh, Larry I'm gonna ask you to to take us a little bit deeper you know, this is a future of infrastructure session, but uh, something Peter said actually struck this in me is the, the future also includes sustaining the existing infrastructure, not just infrastructure that's being, being new. So in the context of that, um, tell us a little bit more about the role and the importance of quality primary data collection in the field. So uh, Outside of my uh, regular role, I'm also an educator, so I, I lean into education very heavily. And, and I would say that there's still a bit of a gap in both the understanding at the high level and, and in even the geospatial industry of just how to begin to collect this information. And so the drive that I would have to answer your question, Aaron, is part of this is teaching what can be done. And you get the aha moment, which is I could collect all this information and I could manage this and make better decisions. Um, but it starts with the people that are doing the work in the field. Primary data collection is not generally even taught in many of the schools. And so I, Part of my life's passion is to bring that to as many people as possible, to teach them the rigors of how to create spatial assets that could be maintained in the future, that could be shared between multiple entities. I'm a big proponent of open data. Um, having more information that's of high quality with the appropriate rigor and standards that go behind it is a really important thing to do. But then again, if you take it a level up and you look at the city managers, the planners, the folks who need to use this information as part of their processes of managing an organization or a city, they have to have quality data in. So it's amongst all of us our responsibility to ensure that with the equipment, the tools, the technology that we're bringing you know, with remote sensing, we could produce massive amounts of data, but the quality and construct of that data, how it's managed, the metadata that goes along with it, how we trace its lineage, its accuracy, 
that's sustainable for the future. That's the investment that we need to make today to create a better system of record, a better digital twin that could be used by the people who will be following us. Yeah, thank you. I, I was always struck that I can track a bag of coffee from Ecuador to my shelf, but I can't track how that water valve was collected. I'm just expected to, to accept it. And, and, and I think another important point that you were hinting at is that for everybody else, the map is not the end, it's the beginning. And that's when decision makers get involved, and it's only at that point that they can start deriving value from it. So along those lines, uh, Andrew, I'd ask you to walk us through platforms such as, as Esri. You know, when I was teaching, teaching the software and, and various modules, we always looked at it as descriptive and prescriptive. We can, we can use these tools to say, here's what's, what is, we're not passing any decisions on it. And then we might also go into a more proactive or forecasting and say, here's what possible could happen from that. Um, so with an eye on that and towards the future, how, how can we use these tools? So I think there's no doubt in the room that we all agree maps shape the world. Maps are how we make good decisions. It's a, it's a, it's a record of how things are, so it helps us approach how we solve the world's challenges. Um, I think it's easy enough for us to all pop into chat BT, uh, GPT, uh, what's the future of infra infrastructure, which, which I did before this, and I will, I will read to you guys some of the bullet points. So cloud computing, 3D GIS, AI, ML, uh, smart cities, urban planning, digesting and consuming and displaying more of the sensors that are out in the marketplace. So these are all sort of general generic terms we can all identify as the future of infrastructure. However, uh, you know, to, to, to go on your question there and kind of elaborate, I'll, I'll reiterate something that a colleague of mine said in the presentation before this, which is a story I've heard numerous times from many organizations, which is we have tons of data. We don't know where that data is or how we get a hold of it. So if, if data is what helps us make those decisions, getting systems in place that allow people to access that data, get a hold of it compared to other things, the, that's what helps us make those decisions. So holistic approaching, of systems that connect and speak to one another, getting the data in front of those people that they can analyze it, put their perspective on it, run those what if scenarios. At Esri, we have uh, a system that works in conjunction with itself. So if we are getting Revit models from our partners at Autodesk, our architects are designing infrastructure, designing buildings. They are putting their, their perspective on the built world. We need to put that built world into the real world because then we can run those scenarios. We can see climate change, we can see sea level rise, flooding scenarios, traffic patterns of people. But the design of that world needs to be brought into the real world so we can contextualize those scenarios to see what happens. So the integration of all these systems is what matters the most. And Esri does have all these solutions, so we can do this. Yeah, fantastic, thank you. Chris. <clears throat> to go back to your question of how, what are we doing today to try to to change how we can address infrastructure in the future. Um, I agree 100% with Peter about the, the digital twin being such an important stakeholder and Trimble is, is working to open up to be more collaborative, to be more participatory in the open standards format because that's how we all are gonna share our data, whether it's our partners at Esri or Autodesk. Um, but the data piece for me, I think, and this is, me speaking personally, I, I feel like we need to, you know, the digital twin to me sometimes feels like a snapshot in time, whereas we need to be more about this operational twin, this one that is evolving with time and deploying the right technology in the field, whether it's sensors of high trust, high quality, to feed back in to these pattern recognition systems, right? We have a lack of, of people to actually do the analysis, so sometimes we need to unlock some of the tools like the AI, well, machine learning or what have you that we've been using for years and to understand those pattern recognitions and to, to look through these massive mountains of data. Like, I think somebody in the previous one said that, you know, the data is not the problem, but the data can be the problem if it's not logically sorted, if it's not organized, and it's too cumbersome to access. So we need to provide the tools where we don't have the individuals 
to really bring the answers or bring the decisions forward at the right point in time so that we don't have another bridge collapse or we don't have something uh, that's catastrophic for our communities and need to be more proactive about that. So, Thank you very much. And that, that leads me into my next question for the panel quite nicely. Uh, you spoke about it. it's one thing to build a digital twin. It's a, quite another thing to sustain it or to, I think you said, a, like an operational twin. Um, so in the last panel session, and I'll, I'll ask it again here, um, do we have the non-technical pieces in place to facilitate the future of infrastructure? Last, in the last session, we spoke about uh, policy, funding, the politics. Are we there? Do we have those pieces that we need for the future infrastructure of this world? Or are there still challenges that you're seeing as you talk to, to people in your respective business lines? We'll, we'll start at this end and work our way back this time. So do we have the funding? I would say uh, it seems like it. Um, whether that funding is actually making it to the end users, I think, is another question. Uh, 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 we've passed policies in the US quite some time ago, uh, injected more funding than I've ever seen. Um, but are we efficient capital allocators of said funding? I'm, I'm not so uh, convinced today. So I do think that's a problem, is actually uh, we, had, we saw some excitement in the community when all the spending was proposed and planned. Um, specifically around infrastructure and, and knowing full well that we need to replace this, but it's actually, um, I, I, you know, from a policy standpoint, the money flow I do think is a, is a problem and how to, I think, uh, how to solve that problem is a little bit bigger than my pay grade, but it's, uh, it is something I see is actually execution on the ground, um, there being this time delay, right? And as Peter pointed out, we don't always have that time. Um, as the infrastructure continues to age. Um, you know, we're three and a half years into um, um, passing funding for uh, fiber to the home in the U.S., for example, uh, and not a single home has been connected. And that's a $42 billion program. Um, I know there's some back-end stuff, but not, not usability, right? And we need to improve that pace. We need to improve that, in my opinion, uh, in order to meet the needs of the future and, and my children and my children's children. Thank you. Your thoughts, Andrew? Yeah, I do think it's, it's a difficult question to answer because I do think the political and personal will of organizations to make these considerations is something that we should be valuing and emphasizing. So in the U.S., we did recently have a, uh, quite a large infrastructure package that was able to push, be pushed through. So the money, the funding seems to be there. Um, what I will say is I do address and support questions more than I ever have before from GC engineering construction firms looking for data to help them understand wetlands delineation or biodiversity impacts. So they are looking for these data sets out there in the world. Um, at Esri, we do have a, we have a tool called the Living Atlas of the World. This is a data catalog that Esri customers can access where they can go get free data layers for Esri customers of these types of information data sets they're looking for. Um, but these, the drivers that help these folks look for these data sets has to also be pushed from other ends. The, the more considerate firms that are looking to minimize their impact on these sensitive environments are something that we want to facilitate, but I, I wish I saw more mandates that require these folks to go make these considerations, and I'm not so sure I see that besides their goodwill. Okay. Your thoughts, Larry? So I have an interesting take on this, and this has a lot to do with the fact that I deal with a lot of small municipalities and cities. Funding for infrastructure projects is much more approachable for larger entities than it is for smaller entities. To get at infrastructure funds for a small city of 10 to 15,000 folks, uh, the grant writing process can be daunting. It's not that it's inaccessible, it's that the, that's a whole other process outside of the geospatial industry is just simply writing a grant. I, I take, for example, a small city that I'm aware of that has less than 5,000 people that has a terrible water system that could really, really use uh, the tools and technologies that both the geospatial industry and the infrastructure funding could actually help with. Um, 
until we as, as practitioners in this world, you know, either help or develop better ways of approaching the grant funding or the other funding vehicles that would help improve our aging infrastructure, there is a bit of a gap that still exists there. Okay. Dion? Yeah, so basically it is a question uh, and uh, uh, what I can see from our branch, from uh, mobile mapping industry, at least here in the Europe, um, uh, it's getting more and more and uh, fonts are there. That's, that's uh, reality. And um, I totally agree with the, it's uh, much difficult, much more difficult with the smaller uh, municipalities, uh, smaller entities, uh, what we can see and um, and that's what's going on now. So it's a more and more fiber companies, uh, huge uh, enterprises where they actually invest in the mobile mapping industry. And uh, if you approach with a, a right solution, everybody use digital twin. And uh, before that, uh, this, is, this was a manual job, basically how they place the cables, how they do the planning, everything design. Uh, today it's, uh, on the digital level, using different platforms, different softwares, um, 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 and uh, basically that's reality. What I can see from our industry, it's more and more, at least in Europe. Okay, great. And Peter? Yeah, yes, sorry, it's getting now a little bit passionate with the funding question, because I think this is going in the right direction, but uh, a little bit wrong. The question is, what would it cost us if we do not invest here? So um, we need to make, that's probably our shared responsibility, not only to tell how much would it cost to um, refurbish a water system. It might be how much would it cost if we wait another five years? What damage would be done? Because the one thing which happens, a decision I take today, if I know what's going on and I invest now, I see positive impact in five years, better impact and lower cost. Waiting the time is having half of the impact because we are too late and the cost is going up. So the funding question is, in details we need to be precise because you need to pay it. You can't only put up the thread what's happening in the, in the future. But this is, is the wrong thinking and this is the power of all the technology we have here on this panel. We need to make clear and tangible, visible and emotionable, feelable what's happened if we don't do it. And now, I warn you, it's passionate. It's a psychological thing. We, we always say mankind is so intelligent, but it works quite on a basic level. If you do the right thing and you get something immediately for it, it works. If you do something bad and there's a bad consequence, you can teach somebody to do the right thing. But with all the infrastructure thing, we have a problem. Somebody does something and at a later point in time, at a later part of this planet, another person has to suffer or benefits from these consequences. And here I need to make uh, uh, what is it, a little bit pessimistic statement. This is not by default in our DNA that we get it. And we need to have the technology to really tell it and feel it and make it clear. What are the consequences of our behavior? And this links to the funding and this links to our decision making. And this links how, to, how do we behave in a SDG thinking with our world on, on a global level. And I just looked up. This is a little bit to the what is it, Earth observation thing. Uh, 1972, uh, it was Apollo 17 that took the picture from our blue planet, blue marble, and we need to come back to this way of thinking. We have a global responsibility for us and everybody and for the future generations. So funding should be a minor tactical issue. We need to have the courage to decide and take the right decisions and take them now. Yes, yeah, so Thank you. Uh, yeah. Th <laughs> no, that's that's a that's a very bold statement. I think one that's much needed. I'm reminded in in the U.S. that several years ago now, the General Accounting Board set up standards because they became quite frustrated in communities that would get a bond or get funding through a grant uh, to build a sewage treatment plant, and they wouldn't maintain the sewage treatment plant, knowing full well that the government would give them money 
to build the next sewage treatment plant. But now they have to show the assessment of that investment. And then if they haven't done a good job at that, their bonds get downgraded on the, on the next investment. So I think that's critically important. And again, leading nicely into my, my next question, we've heard uh, funding, we've heard standards, we've heard all these, these types of things. What, which, maybe more than one, but what, what opportunities do you see where there's a benefit for the entire industry to work on something together? There are gonna be many things that we differentiate on. Are there things, you know, is there a way to write a, a spec or some standards for a small community to apply for something geospatial that could be used throughout the geospatial community? Are there standards, be them ISO or otherwise, uh, TC211, that speak to how you do this? How do I pull all this data together? How do I make sure I'm not missing something? Um, I know some of this work's being done even as we sit here, but are there ways that we can do that, again, in service of this future of infrastructure, not just in the local communities, but you know, rolling that all the way up to the global community. And I just open that up to anybody who wants to comment. I think if you look in the subsurface utility industry, there are standards developing. And, and that's a huge, huge importance. So we think about the monitoring and mapping of, of infrastructure that's in the ground. You could look at uh, publicized data of how many times we strike pipes, we cut fiber, we hit gas lines. It, it's not only a problem for the event, it's a problem for the people, it's a safety thing, it's, it's a maintainable thing. So I, I could start the conversation and say some of the standards that have been developed by the, the quality and rigor of recording those things have a high degree of potential, not for just the maintenance of more stuff that we're gonna put in the ground potentially adjacent to that, but for the safety and maintainability of those assets going forward in the future. Did we put plastic in the ground that might decay in 10 years? Um, is there lead in any of the materials that we put in the ground? If we record that today and are aware of it tomorrow because we developed a standard about how we collected that information, that is very important. Yeah, I'm reminded when I started my career on a survey crew of trying to locate water lines before they put tracer wires on them, trying to find a, a plastic pipe four feet underground that has, that has no, nothing to, to locate it by. Um, I think, Andrew, maybe you were gonna say something? Uh, stack catalog. Consistency is number one for us. I'm biased on the imagery team, but some stack catalog standardization really helps folks be able to search by location to find imagery data sets that may be applicable to the projects they're working on. So they don't have to locally have the image data sets on their computer, but the ability to drop in a web link so they can see what data is available for the projects they're working on, I think some standardization around that would be quite helpful. So stack catalog is my number one. Yep. Uh, I think standards are important and open standards and we had recently the opportunity to acquire a really cool company, Cesium, and they have been open source and it was a clear decision from our end, we need to keep it open. I think I elaborated on, on diversity and the foundation for diversity is openness. So this, this is one thing. But I'd like to touch to if it comes to standard and do we have the right standards to, to, to Larry's point because as a geophysicist I'm really interested in the subsurface and there is one thing which went really wrong sometimes. We are all focused on data, data cent centricity. I fully get it. But I see examples where you talk to a customer, government and whatever, they look at the data they have and then they try to find out what could we do with it and find a use case based on the data. And this is wrong. This is completely wrong because they should look what is the most relevant thing we could do? What is the most important thing for our municipality? What is the biggest threat for our infrastructure? And then they need to see what kind of data is it? And the second step is I need to have standards to work with this data in, in masses with many stakeholders. So the one thing is we should keep in mind not the data should 
make the use case, the use case, <laughs> use case should make the data, and the data makes the best structure to handle it in an open way with other vendors, with other data formats, and to really have a common interest to tackle the problem. We do not have enough time and resources to compete or to build property stuff or vendor logins. We have a lot to do, and we can do it just together. Perfect. Anyone else? I just agree with most everything Peter just said. So <laughs> <laughs> I like this guy. <laughs> This is why we need to have these discussions because there is no one size fits all, no one one uh, size. And, and I think also respectful of different locations around the globe have different factors that are governing or pulling tension in one direction or another on these topics. So I think it is very important. So believe it or not, we're closing in here on our, our time together today, but I do want to give the opportunity to each of you in, as we close to, to maybe share um, three or four minutes on the future. And what I mean by that is as you look ahead five to even 10 years, which is very difficult, even on the simplest things, so I know it's a big, big ask, but if you would, please share something that excites you the most about what you're working on or what you've seen maybe even here this week in Stuttgart uh, about working with geospatial or earth observation data and tools in the context of a more sustainable future infrastructure. Um, you know, I think, yes, it's important to understand the lay, the lay of the land and the challenges ahead of us, but where do you see, where do you see possibility? Where do you see excitement as you look ahead? Let's start, start with you, Chris. We've talked a lot about data today, and I, I, you know, five to 10 years, I hope we can kind of maybe forget the moniker of data and just assume or, or just trust one another uh, through open standards that the data is there, the data is good. It's turning that into information, and that's really what excites me the most, is what tools can we apply in the near future? It's probably not an open AI large language model, but maybe a large data model. Um, and how to reach in to this ocean of information that we have so that people can make decisions faster with that data. So uh, I, I just hope that, you know, in the future, I see that the more efficiency we can bring to this process, the faster we can address this vast infrastructure needs that the world has and is only continuing to grow. So I don't have much more to say about that, so I can yield my time to the others. Okay, Hi. thank you. Andrew? Um, so I was trying to look up a statistic, but specifically I'll, I'll reference, uh, so we're talking about infrastructure and the future of infrastructure. And I was part of a presentation a couple years ago where I learned about the percent of material on a construction site that goes to waste. And I think it's 40% of building material ends up in a landfill or some absurd amount of landfill material is construction building material. And some of the stories I've heard around imagery capture, and the ability to improve the efficiency of, the, of these construction sites, I think is a significant improvement area that as we learn and grow and compare data from scanning, from imagery, from all these tools, as we see these project sites and we understand the deconfliction of putting down material, laying down areas, putting people, these, the ability to eliminate the waste from these building sites, I think is a significant improvement that we can all do a much, much better job as, we, as the technology expands. So, Construction waste, that's mine. Very good, Larry. So I'm particularly interested, not so much in the technology. This is a technologist saying I'm not interested in the technology. But the reality is, is we've actually created some amazing technology. But I'll actually get back to, to Peter's point. We need to be asking ourselves the questions of what and why before we think about the how. The, I, I look through these, these halls and I find so much how we solve various problems. But we need to, we, the next level is not just simply collecting the data, it's, it's the temporal effect of that data. The data that you collect today represents a moment in time. What is that data? going to represent 
a year from now, five years from now, 10 years from now? How are we going to manage it? How are we going to ask it questions? So as we really ask ourselves to evolve as practitioners of people thinking about infrastructure or all the other things that could come along with that, the biggest thing is, gosh, there's a lot of ways to solve the problems, to collect the data, the how. But to ask ourselves those questions of what do we want to see the future of this data look like for the people who are going to look at this well after I'm not here. Yep. Go ahead, John. Yeah, so uh, basically what will be the future, nobody knows, but if you take a look 20 years behind and uh, 15, 20, if you take a look uh, what's going on on Intergeo, for example, and when they started with GNSS receivers and these kind of things, uh, there was a big change in these 10, 15 years, incredible change. And if you take a look what we have now, for example, you can imagine what will happen in 10 years, and I totally agree that it's more a question what will happen if we don't take this road, what, what will happen then? And uh, um, basically that's it. Yeah, so there's a cost to not taking action. Exactly. Oftentimes exactly. not discussed. Peter. Uh, yes, even if we have been talking about the future of infrastructure, for me, it's important we mention that our infrastructure has a coordinate, uh, but it's not only a coordinate, it interacts with our environment. So if we plan our infrastructure, if we optimize it and we understand how to run it, we need to consider we are taking space. We are um, having influence on precipitation, infiltration, and all this kind of stuff. It's way more simple, even if we don't have it, Larry, to have a digital twin of the pipe for wastewater and water. But to really build a model of how groundwater and uh, flooding and all this kind of stuff is working, this is where I see the, the future. And as a geophysicist, I'm passionate. And I made the point, sometimes we do not have the right collection of information. So if we have the possibility and uh, the intellectual capacity to build a uh, the infrastructure and the interaction of the infrastructure with the environment, so the full picture of natural and built environment, how it interacts and how it works, then we are really getting close to sustainability because sustainability applies for the infrastructure and it needs to apply for our natural environment. And this is a big thingy. It, it's not easy if people told me I'm probably over ambitious, I'm too old to get it done before I retire. But at least I try to get it started and somebody takes it on. Very nice. Well, we've covered a lot of technical as well as non-technical topics here in the last little bit of time together. Um, are there, I'll just open the floor here in the little bit of time we have left. Is there anything we haven't touched on you think that is relevant or important that you'd like to share? I'll go back and make the, a point that I made earlier again, which is this idea of there being massive amounts of data and getting that data in the right hands of the right people. So we talk about, at Esri, we talk about our curated solutions. So we talk about building web services or dashboards or a link. So data accessibility is what makes a lot of these hopeful dreams that Peter is, is mentioning possible. When we silo or we restrict, we can't use that in critically important data to make those smart decisions. We do have our challenges. The, the, the world is facing significant challenges, and we have to get smart people the data they need to help us improve the conditions that we're all under. Couldn't agree more. Chris? Uh, along those same lines, Andrew, I think that um, bringing that traceability, bringing that, um, that transparency to the community that is involved with these projects, and whether it's a reclamation of a dam site, which needs a lot of uh, um, you know, geographic, technical, geographic, uh, uh, or 
underground knowledge, but just like bringing in the, the buy-in of the community, I think, and whether that's a dashboard to present progress or a dashboard to show like how the funding is being spent, I think that's an important part of the engagement that we need to help bring about um, from our community, from our sense of understanding of, of these elements of progress tracking or, or, or project tracking or asset utilization and tracking in the future so that the community feels a sense of buy-in as well uh, to, to what's being done. Very good. Anyone else? Hi. Um, I need to admit I'm chairman, so I need to come back to the regulation thing. <laughs> so, mindset thing about regulations. Regulations are sometimes used as an excuse not to do anything. This is not the right thing to use it. Regulation gives you a playground, and my challenge would be understand regulations, go to the maximum what the regulations allow, and if you find out a real good use case, a good value why they need to be changed, then go for it. So never ever take a regulation as an excuse not to act. Accept them, push them to the limits and make a business case or a, a, a rational case out of it why it needs to be changed and adopted. This is a way more mature way to handle it. And you can name it if it's AI Act, if it's Data Act and, and all the other stuff. If you just complain, you won't change anything. Do what's possible and then get it improved. Regulation help you to give you some starting points. See it as a safe playground you can start with and then move forward as bright as you and your customers are to challenge it moving forward. I like that. That, that dovetails in nicely to our previous session where we were talking about doing the thing right over doing the right thing. And sometimes doing the right thing requires us to push those boundaries in order to make improvement. Larry or Dijon, any final thoughts? One final thought. I, I would just say, don't be afraid to get creative. Uh, I could think of an example where a customer took an e-bike, a GPS receiver, a tablet, and a copy of Esri Field Maps. And they said, we're going to go out and map a bunch of water meters. And after a month and a little bit of exercise, they had a whole city's worth of water meters. So there's novel solutions out there, even if the funding isn't there. Uh, it just requires thinking a little creatively sometimes. Very good. Here, here. All right. Um, well, I think we're going to have to leave it there. Uh, not enough time really to, to jump into another deep topic. So um, thank you all for participating in our panel today. And I'd encourage us all to give them a round of applause. Thank you.